On this edition of North Bay Bountiful, we explore rivers and streams. More than just beautiful natural waterways, our stewardship of healthy rivers and streams is the key to the survival of the environment and our very lives. North Bay Bountiful is made possible in part by Rocky, the free-range chicken, and Rosie, the original organic chicken, the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, Made Local Magazine and Sonoma County Go Local, and through the generous support of the Sonoma County Water Agency. Cultivate. Celebrate. Connect. The story of rivers and streams is a story of water health. In California, watersheds are impacted by many negative factors, from urban development and water runoff to chemical loading from pharmaceuticals and agriculture. An additional pressure is the drought and flood cycle that is worsening each year due to factors of climate change. Mariska Obazinski is the COHO Monitoring Program Coordinator with the California Sea Grant. She understands how our health and the health of wildlife are both tied to rivers and streams. Streams are a reflection of the watershed or the landscape. So, you know, if our streams are in good condition, that's a reflection that we're, we're taking good care of our land. So salmon and steelhead populations are indicators of the health of our watersheds. Uh, salmon, um, coho salmon in particular, they, um, they live part of their life in fresh water up in the headwater streams and then they have to migrate out to the ocean through the river systems through the estuaries and then spend about a year and a half in the ocean and then they have to migrate all the way back to spawn and complete their life cycle and so they need the environment to be in really good condition in all of those areas in order for them to survive. In the Sonoma County community of Camp Meeker, California, the people came together to reconcile their history and forge a new path forward to return their creek to its original state. of the trees must have just been immense. So we get a sense that the system must have been incredibly complex and diverse and dark and cold and cool and exactly like our salmon and steelhead like. This creek was had huge log jams full of wood. Melvin Meeker, after the area was logged, realized he's got a railroad here that ran down to Sausalito. So people from San Francisco get on the ferry, get on the train in Sausalito, come up here, and the Russian River is beginning to become a big resort area, but that was a longer trip. And there were a series of dams that were put in Dutch Bill Creek. They called them flashboard dams. They built a concrete structure that was open in the winter, and the creek would flow. And then late in the spring, they would put wood in there, and that would back it up. It would make a temporary pool. And that was really the place where the community came together and had parties and picnics and where young people fell in love. And, I mean, it was really the heart of the community. It was the heart and soul of the community. Here we'd swim back and forth. You know, they had two diving boards over here, and we had a snack shack there, then there was the playground. And my cousin would come home from my grandmother with the, all the crawdads, and she'd cook them up in the pan. Oh, how fun. Camp Meeker Dam did not have adequate fish passage to get coho and steelhead past when they were migrating during winter flows coming upstream excessive jump to get into the bottom of the Market Street crossing, then excessive velocities and thin flows over much of the range of passage to get through it, and then you get up to the dam. And again, where you experience either a leap or very high velocity barriers throughout the range of flows when fish would be normally trying to pass upstream. Westminster Woods, Alliance Redwoods, and Camp Meeker Park and Recreation Department received a letter that we had to remove our summer dams. And, and so that was huge, that was a big difference. A lot of these communities depending on those summer dams and it became a big issue. You know, they have such a love of the trees and of the fish and of the creek, and yet it was hard for them. You know, when the dam got decommissioned, it was hard to adjust. And I was always disappointed to see that this had all been let go and 
it was all overgrown. There was no more beach. And it's like, God, you know, it used to be the funnest part of being up here. You know, we went through the classic grief paradigm thing is we're angry at first that fish and game made us do it. Then we got really sad about it. And people are just kind of depressed that it wasn't there. And then we realized, you know, we need to accept this and see what we can do next. So the watershed group there, who had been meeting about the watershed, saw an opportunity to bring together a community discussion around, well, what would it look like to remove the dam and restore the creek and have some recreational value? Yeah, we were all visioning and coming up with great ideas and everything, but there's the old, you know, show me the money. How are we going to fund this thing? Every year there's a competitive process similar to people competing for a scholarship. The more endangered species, the more types of runs, types of fish that can be restored, the higher the status. It had been decades since coho had been documented in this watershed. And we asked some old timers up in Camp Meeker and they said, some of them said there were never any salmon in the creek. In December of 2001, one of our staff, Tim Qualls, was um, walking along the creek and saw some fish in the creek. We called up everybody we could in Fish and Game and Noah and Nymphs and says, my staff saw these fish and they're big and they've got red and a green head and we think they're, uh, they're coho, you should come. They sometimes are called the silver salmon and the female was just like moving along, you could see the reflection. There were people who thought Dutch Bill Creek was just an urban ditch and had no value to coho at all. And it completely turned around the perception and has set in motion all of this work since then. The return of the coho that year demonstrated that this was one of the special watersheds in the Russian River where coho wanted to return to and when conditions were right, they would have viable progeny. So not long after that, I get a call from Leah Mahan with NOAA in the Community Restoration Grants Program. And as it turns out, they had some money available, somewhere around $190,000 that was dedicated to restoration. And we hadn't been getting a lot of support. People were like, whatever. Because the ball starts rolling when the money gets thrown out on the table. And that's what Leah did is in her wonderful, nice and charismatic way, she said, oh, big pot of money. Let's do a project. As soon as that happened, then other funding agencies were just like in line because this was such a high profile project. It was so important for Coho Salmon. It was a community project and it's publicly accessible. It could be a teaching ground. If they built the grade back up at the downstream end, they put baffles through the culvert itself to help reduce the water velocities and increase the water depths. Build a weir, take it down, pick new boulders, rebuild it again until you get it to the spot that you like it and it's going to work. We're just as solid as could be. And the size of the rock, I mean, that rock's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> The dam wanted to stay there. We ended up having to get a larger hammer, which necessitated a larger excavator. Uh, it had more rebar in it than anyone expected. Uh, and it went much deeper into the ground and was tied into existing boulders underneath the ground, which made it also more challenging. The dam took us about two, two and a half weeks longer to remove than we had scheduled, but we got it out. Once the dam was gone, people began to see what this is going to look like. The setting of the bridge was the highlight of the project. They chose a bridge made of Corten steel. It took approximately two to two and a half hours to set the crane up to be able to lift the bridge. The lifting of the bridge took about eight minutes. And so it's a very intense moment because you really don't know if the bridge is going to settle into the abutments, if the holes that are in the bridge that are there so that it can be bolted to the abutment are going to line up exactly with the bolts that you've embedded in the concrete. Hi. Everybody in the hole? It dropped perfectly right over all the bolts. Surveyors are cheering, engineers cheering, town's cheering, 
Uh, it, was, it was just spectacular. It also gave a nice, mm, okay, the project is ready. It isn't necessarily done, but the project's ready because the, the, the bridge is in. You'll see that a lot of the channel has very fast moving water or riffles or kind of what you might think is rapids. But these are, are very suitable areas for the fish to, to lay their eggs. Uh, we started installing a number of woody debris structures, that's the root wads and logs that are lodged into the banks and the root wads protrude. To give us some riffles and maybe some uh, you know, scour holes and scour features, all to give the bed some complexity to create an uh, area that would be suitable for potentially spawning. The last part of the process here is the planting that attempts to restore habitat, prevent erosion, and restore the general balance of the creek. The health of this creek is important to the health of the Camp Meeker community. Being able to recapture the use of this area and integrate that with a salmonid creek. And I hope that we're going to see both coho and steelhead running in the stream within my lifetime. They'll find a better place to spawn and a better place to rear their summer babies and a better place for those smolts that are going to the ocean to get through. The kids can you know, be involved in ecological restoration and hopefully they can get, you know, they can get their feet wet too. You're sitting there 20 feet above the project and you can look up and downstream and look at this beautiful stretch of the creek and you can come down at the right time of year and actually see salmon going upstream to spawn. It's so cool bringing hundreds of kids down here and seeing how over a long period of time, 13 years ago, a group of people came together, not necessarily being on the same page, and were able to take a dam out and restore a habitat. And I mean, that's the piece that gives me hope that we can restore communities in a way that can bring back the salmon. We are learning that being good stewards of our watersheds and riparian corridors is a practice that preserves land, protects wildlife, and improves the quality of our water. The hope is that the next generation of environmentally minded citizens will take these first steps and build upon them. It's really important to educate kids about our watersheds and you know fish populations. Um, they're the ones who are going to be left with, um, you know, the messes that we've made over the last hundred years. And so if you can learn all of that at a really young age, you know, it, it becomes kind of ingrained in your thinking. I think um, that's going to be what it takes um, to really improve things in the long run. In Sausalito, an elementary school situated on a small creek leading to the San Francisco Bay put their student power to work and have created a model of smart watershed management. More than 5,000 years ago, nobody lived here. Just plants and animals lived at the creek. They used it for food and water. 5,000 years ago, the Miwoks had a seasonal village down by the creek. They used it for food, water, and shelter. They lived in harmony with the plants and animals and protected them. In 1775, their lives changed forever. Between 1775 and 1820, explorers discovered Sausalito. They took over the land the Miwoks had and claimed it for their homeland. During the Rancho period in the 1800s, William Richardson owned Rancho del Sausalito and made it his home. He let his cows graze by the creek. A distillery and railroad were built in the late 1800s. The Chinese railroad workers lived nearby. The distillery produced medicine and alcohol. In World War II, workers built Liberty ships at Marin Ship. Later, the shipyards filled with boat builders who constructed houseboats and sailboats. The distillery along the creek burnt down. Condos are being built by the creek, and people are polluting the creek with oil, trash, and pesticides. No one knows or seems to care about the native plants and animals at the creek. The creek is so overgrown with invasive plants like broom, blackberries, ivy, poison oak, thistle, and fennel, it is very hard to even see the creek beneath all the overgrowth and trash. 
This is the creek now. The invasive plants are cleared. New native plants are being planted. There's still work to do, but now we begin to see the results of five years of hard work. Willow Creek got involved with the Creek Project about five or six years ago. We were working with naturalists from Point Bonita on outdoor education programs, and they came up with the idea of trying to restore this little piece of creek that they knew was very close to the school. So the people at Point Bonita, the YMCA, requested a grant from an organization called State Farm and they gave us $25,000 to start taking care of the creek. So we came up with ideas of what to do, most of which involved getting rid of non-native plants and then planting proper plants that are native and that belong there. And then as you all know, there's been you know water testing and you're learning all about where the water originally comes from and perhaps someday we can make the creek larger and bigger and maybe even come through the school campus. This is the fourth year of this project and when we began this entire area was overgrown with non-native fennel and blackberry, uh, Himalayan blackberry. So now all of the plants that you see uh, excluding the, the larger willows and other trees uh, have been planted by students and volunteers to help restore the habitat here for native animals, including insects like this one. And it's all done because of uh, students and their hard work and grants that we've received. There's gonna be this big party down at the creek on Nevada Street. And um, we're gonna be planting and taking out plants. And there's gonna be food and drinks and anybody who wants to come can come. It's out in nature and I like nature and it's cool. I work as a naturalist for the Point Benita YMCA Outdoor Education Center. And here I'm working for Willow Creek to teach the children about whatever they ask questions about regarding the native plants or animals. What we can do to help protect the plants. When they're young, we can water them in the dry season. And always we can be respectful of them. So we should always look where we're walking and have a soft step. The creek had a lot of plants, and some of them we've planted today. Seep spring, windberry, California blackberry, to name a few. There's red elderberry, and we've planted coyote brush, and bulrushes. That way the roots can spread, can spread more quickly. It's so there are lots and lots and lots of plants that grow along fresh water at a creek here in the Bay Area, and we're planting those again today. It's really hard, but it's worth it because we need a lot more animals over here, and there's not that really na much native plants around here, so we're trying to grow more. I'm planting grass, California native grass. It can restore the creek and make a habitat for animals so that they could live here again. The fish gonna come back. They're gonna be. In the future, the creek is crystal clear and invasive plants are nowhere to be seen. Willow Creek Grove is thick with native plants and many native species have returned to make the creek their home. Northern California faces the problem of long periods of drought and short, powerful periods of flooding. Learning to predict rainfall and manage water in this uncertain environment is essential to protecting our rivers, streams, and water supply. You know, in Sonoma County, we have so much rain during the winter season. Um, 
that if we can figure out how to store it, there's more than enough to last us the summer. So it's just working on different water storage projects. So there's a lot going on there. There's a lot more information out there about rainwater catchment tanks and, you know, just your average person like me who knows nothing about, you know, storing water in tanks and irrigation. So I think there's a lot of resources out there now to be able to, um, you know, make, be more conservative with our water use, you know, and, and still get the water that we need. Scientists are now studying a very different kind of river. Atmospheric rivers are weather patterns that carry more moisture than the rivers and streams on land. More accurate prediction of these rivers in the sky will help California better manage water capture in anticipation of the dry summers ahead. Every year, most people in the West Coast recognize that a big chunk of our rain comes from a few big storms, and we've discovered what we call atmospheric rivers because they're these narrow regions in the atmosphere where it's very moist and the winds are very strong, and those winds push that moisture along as water vapor, much like a river on land pushes water along as liquid. So in one atmospheric river at a given moment, it's transporting on average as much water vapor as 20 times the liquid water from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. These are truly rivers of moisture in the atmosphere and they represent just a few percent of the circumference of the earth if you add them all up. Ongoing research into atmospheric rivers could play a pivotal role in the way Northern California prepares for winter storms and manages water supply. When they hit California or the West Coast, they often last about a day we might get six to 10 in an average year. If we get fewer than that, we end up in drought. If we get more than that, we end up with flood risk. Precipitation transported by atmospheric rivers can account for one third to one half of California's annual water supply. This weather phenomenon has also contributed to all major Russian river floods since 1997. It only takes a few of these atmospheric rivers at any given time on the planet to transport almost all of the water vapor that is being moved around in the atmosphere. So they are really the engine of the global water cycle, and they are what make or break California precipitation. In the early 1860s, atmospheric rivers caused a statewide natural disaster in California. One of the most catastrophic floods in California occurred in the well, in 1861-62, it rained heavily for 43 days. The precipitation was about three times the long-term average across the state. It was a series of atmospheric rivers with cascading effects because they followed one upon another so quickly against an already wet condition. There was quite a bit of snow in the Sierras and some of that melted. You had a huge runoff of, of water that ran down the rivers and filled the Sacramento Valley. So it literally turned the entire Sacramento Valley into an inland sea, about 10 feet deep. It washed away farms, thousands of farms, and uh, so you had things like horses and cattle floating down toward the San Francisco Bay. Sacramento had to be abandoned. Then Governor Leland Stanford had to go to his inauguration in a boat, and then had to relocate the capital to San Francisco. Uh, until the floodwater strained. The state went into bankruptcy as a result of this flood. They've actually modeled this flood, a scenario called the arc storm, to see, well, what if this flood occurred today? How would it impact the state? How would we prepare for it? And what would happen? It'd be worse than the big earthquake if it should reoccur today. Some estimates have put the dollar damage somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 billion. I think an important part of understanding atmospheric rivers is in the predictive power of that, being able to forecast it and prepare people, mitigate the impacts. 
California deploys four unique atmospheric river observatories to identify and monitor atmospheric rivers as they make landfall. One is located in Bodega Bay. But early monitoring begins over the Pacific Ocean. Because these storms, these atmospheric rivers, typically come from over the ocean to the west coast, we need to measure them over the ocean. And that will help give us lead time of a day or two or three as we try to anticipate the details of where and when an atmospheric river might hit the coast. The observations we use primarily for atmospheric rivers are satellite-based. It just paints out this beautiful, long, narrow region of concentrated water vapor. However, that's not the whole story. We can have a lot of water vapor and it can have a shape that looks like an atmospheric river, but maybe the winds are weak. So one thing we've started doing the last few years is taking research aircraft from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, from NASA, uh, from the Air Force, and going out and measuring these storms in terms of their winds. In meteorology, airborne reconnaissance for storms has been done for decades for hurricanes for the East Coast, or for nor'easters if you're in New England. For the West Coast, this is the type of storm that warrants that kind of observation, and we're inventing today with the National Weather Service and others how to do this. So many decisions are made every day based on weather forecasts whether it's gonna be dry or hot or wet or windy. So many things from energy to water to people's daily activities to transportation are affected by weather prediction. The better we understand the phenomena that we're trying to predict, the better we're gonna be able to predict them. Rivers and streams are resources for wildlife, for our drinking water, and for beauty and recreation. We can no longer take these watersheds for granted. States, communities, and individuals, we all need to play our part in conserving and preserving our precious water. So one of the biggest things I think people can do to help is just conserve water. The more people that you can educate at a young age so that you know, as they go through their lives, they're making all those little small changes, you know, conserving water or, um, you know, not paving a driveway or all those little things, they all add up and that's, you know, that's what it's gonna take to, to really improve streams and watersheds.